What is the rejuvenome? I know it has to do with longevity, but I, yeah. I'm curious a little bit more about the details. I mean, I guess the basic motivation is that, or like one, one view of, of what's going on in the aging research field is that there's a lot of interesting tantalizing kind of hints at things, but it's, there's still a lot that's not understood about what's fundamentally going on, either at a theoretical level or at kind of just a raw data cohesion kind of level. Um, so there are various drugs and treatments that are shown to extend lifespan in various kinds of animals. Um, there are various other treatments that are not shown to extend lifespan uh, or health span in some functional sense, like, you know, how frail is, is the animal, how fast does it run on the wheel or what have you, but that does something else. Like if you look at the transcriptome of the liver, you know, it looks younger or something like that. Um, there are other things that are just like people have only looked at particular cells. You know, this makes stem cells divide faster or something like that. And so there's kind of this very interesting and tantalizing set of results, but it's also kind of piecemeal. You know, does the stem cell thing, what does that do to the liver? How does that depend on the genetic background of the mice? Does that actually extend lifespan also, right? If you only ask kind of one question at a time, it's very hard to compare across experiments because there also might be some systematic difference in your experiment. Maybe it extends lifespan, but the baseline lifespan is shorter because you had to give them a drug or something, whatever. You know, even the control drug makes their, sh their life shorter or something like that. So, um, so how do you kind of systematize all this? And so basically the question is how do you make a pipeline that can be applied to genetically diverse mice over their whole lifespan, where you're measuring both this kind of lifespan, health span, functional stuff, and you're basically going in every organ and you're saying, getting a profile and saying, you know, even if you don't understand that profile, here's the vector of what the liver looks like. And is that vector closer or farther from the young vector versus the old vector? Um, so can you kind of profile that way? And then if only if you can do that, we think, would it then start to make sense to look at combination therapies? Because you basically you can say, well, here, this vector for this therapy, this vector for that therapy, we're trying to go over here. Um, what are the vectors that we want to combine? If you don't have a coherent notion of the vector, you just have one or two components here and there, it's like very hard to rationally d d design combinations. I think that the rejuvenome is pretty exciting because if you talk to people in the field, even who do one of these single like organs or one of these single interventions or basically any lab, everyone's so excited about it. No one, none of these labs could fund the study. They would never consider it. They're all excited to use the data because it's going to really help kind of uniformly people within the space advance their own research and compare their research to other people's research as well. And to be clear, this is very hard to do. Um, you know, in other studies where they've done the genetically diverse mice, even the genetically diverse mice getting a robust result, you know, it depends, they have three different sites, you know, ex experimental sites, or like, how do you even measure, you know, these things over a whole lifespan? It's going to take years, right, to do it. And it's, it's a lot of money also to do the, the omic analysis of each of these tissues and a lot of processing. And so how do you decide? Do you sequence it now? Do you bank the samples and wait until sequencing is cheaper? You know, there's, it's actually like quite difficult to do this right, and and so that's why it also requires like a lot of kind of project management and you know just design and sort of thinking on a time scale that would be hard for an individual student or postdoc to to say I'm going to just coordinate this whole thing. You know, Nick Nick Shom, who's running this project um, for Astera, is pretty lucky because he's partnering with the Buck, who has or the Buck Institute on Aging, who has just extensive experience designing and running mouse experiments, um, which is why this is FRO inspired, because kind of building out a wet lab and doing it ourselves was not the best way to run this experiment. Um, I think that everyone involved is really kind of excited about the outcomes rather than like sticking everything into an FRO shaped box. <laughs> Yeah, and I think there isn't even absolutely defined FRO shape box. I think that it's a really good tool for eliciting projects that have certain kinds of needs and characteristics. And then each one, they will all be different. And sometimes they will insource or outsource different parts of things and so on, or partner with other people. And that's all OK. It, it's not meant that FRO has to be totally isolated from its environment or have some incredibly rigorous set of rules. But at the same time, we do want to have some process that makes it easier to, to spin these up with some amount of uniformity and work as a nonprofit and be acceptable to donors and all those other things. And that, that does mean you need a certain amount of process. Mm -hmm.